Okay, so we have our last topic, which is technological change, adoption, acceptance, and appropriation of IT by organizations and our society. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, change is something that everyone should study, but particularly people involved with IT need to study change because we are, IT is, is many times used as a change uh, factor or as, as a change you know, the, the way to achieve change. Mainly after we, we already know that organizations have structures and their culture and, uh, you know, people's behaviors and everything that are all sort of pre-organized in, in a specific way. Uh, and, and, and of course, change comes to, to alter or to, to, ch to change all of that. Uh, we, it, it, it seems very, very important that uh, we we pay attention to, to this. Uh, when I think in our first class, I mentioned that sometimes we're involved with localized exploitation. It was one of those uh, Venka Truman and Henderson, or actually a Venka Truman paper, I think. Uh, when we're involved with local exploitation of technology, that means that the change is going to be very local, very uh, con con concealed to those that are directly involved, and therefore change is not an issue. But when we are part of a change that is larger, that is more systemic, we, we, we do have to, to, to be careful, to be very careful about the plan and the planning of the change process because different people will be affected in different ways. There will be people that will feel that the change is positive, others will feel that it's negative, some will be supporters of that change, others will be people that will either resist to it, boycott it, uh, or, or sabotage it, and so on and so forth. Uh, in the, in the information systems field, we have studied for quite a while uh, adoption and acceptance of technologies because, of course, people were interested in knowing what they had to do so that the systems that they had developed or the change that they were proposing was indeed uh, embraced by those who would be affected by it. Right? At the beginning, the, the studies on adoption and acceptance of technology uh, even consider those two words as being synonyms. Well, I don't know, depending on, on, on your language, uh, those words may seem more similar or less similar, but even if we think of it in, and of course both, both these words, acceptance and adoption, have a Latin origin, uh, but they are here in, in, in English and, and, and they appear in, in, in many other languages. Uh, and, and those words, adopt and accept, have different meanings, uh, originally at least. So I don't know how you perceive that difference. Well, what is the difference between accepting something and adopting something? Adopt something that you don't accept, just because uh, maybe it's required to adopt it or to copy it. But acceptance is now. Uh, like you incorporate it because you, you Okay, that could be what we, again, uh, there's no only possible way of trying to make the difference between those words. But uh, acceptance, uh, at least to me, seems to be more a little more binary in the sense that binary is zero or one. You know, you either accept or you don't accept. Of course, we can have different levels of acceptance sometimes, depending on... If we're talking about a, a complex system, we may accept some of the features and reject others, right? But accepting is still... Uh, the thing is already there, and I can either uh, agree with it or disagree with it, okay? Adopt, uh, uh, adopting a system, uh, the, the roots of the word adopt is having an option. Right? Adoptare uh, uh, means having an option. So uh, I, I would believe that if we went back to the beginning of the, well, to the meanings of those words, we would say that uh, uh, the person who adopts something has a choice. And you adopt this alternative to a different alternative. Right? You choose. Adoption involves choosing among more than one alternative. Acceptance only refers to one, one alternative that has been given to us. So in general, at least my understanding of uh, uh, you know, the way we deal with, with uh, these issues is that usually the boss 
or the decision maker adopts, chooses which system will be used, for example, by the organization. And then after someone has adopted the system, others will simply have to accept it. Right? So most of the workers will have to accept because the boss has already chosen. Right? It's slightly different to, to your perception, Serge, but, uh, but I think it, 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 this would be what would be more directly related to the original meaning of adopting something, adopting coming from being able to choose, and accepting uh, being, well, considering that this has already been given, I, I can accept or refuse it. So it's, it, it becomes more binary in that sense. That, uh, but it's curious that uh, <coughs> the literature in information systems treats adoption and acceptance almost as if they were synonyms. Right? And maybe it has not made that much difference uh, until recently, because most of in, in most situations, uh, the, or at least in the most situations that were studied at the beginning of the studies in, in adoption and acceptance of systems, um, people were, were talking about systems that someone adopted, let's say the boss decided, oh, I've heard, uh, we're going back, uh, tracing back what happened in the 1980s or so. The boss said, well, I've heard that personal computers are the future, that every organization, uh, every person in an organization will have a personal computer in front of them in a few years. So I adopted or I chose to buy uh, one personal computer for us to experiment. It's in that box there. If there is anyone in this room who's, who's interested in learning, go grab it and start working with it. So notice, the boss adopted and then he invited other people, he or she invited other people to also adopt because they still had the option of using the new technology or keep doing what they were doing until then. Right? At, at the very beginning, I, I believe that this is what caused the, this mix-up between adoption and acceptance. And mo most researchers were interested in, in finding ways of con convincing people that using technology was the thing to do. In fact, there was so much uh, research on that that we came up to a few models that are the models that are best studied in information systems. One of them is the technology acceptance model by Fred Davis. <coughs> Let me see if I can show this in a... No, I just want to pick one of them here and make it big. No, instead of making it bigger... Oh, well, anyway... Uh, Okay, oh, this this looks good. If I can uh, see, so this is this is the technology acceptance model, as proposed uh, by Fred Davis in his uh, original studies of uh, technology acceptance. He said, "Look, uh, people. Of course, what what interests us is to know if people are are actually going to use the system that we're proposing. Uh, but this will depend on the behavior these people have." Uh, with respect to to that technology, this is, this has been a lot. Uh, this has been influenced by um, social uh, sorry uh, psychologists who had all this theory on planned behavior by humans, uh, and then they said, well, but the behavior itself depends on attitudes that people develop uh, with respect to, to, to the technology, and these attitudes will depend on two variables: perceived usefulness and perceived uh, ease of use. So what these guys were saying to us was that we would uh, uh, more likely adopt or accept, remember they were using those words as synonym, uh, synonyms, uh, adopt or, or accept a, a system, the more this system w w was able to show us that it was useful and to show us that it was easy to use. Uh, well, uh, let's say that the model, this, this model was Fred Davis uh, doctoral thesis, but I would say that even a 10-year-old kid would agree with it, right? If you say, well, if, 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 you, if you want someone to use something that you're proposing and you make uh, that, you make this person understand that it's easy to use and that it's going to be useful, that is a very good push that you do towards uh, getting them to use it. Right? The problem, for example, with, informa with information systems is at the beginning, uh, companies well, uh, made the, the, the investment. Sometimes they, they even, well, in countries like ours, like in the emerging countries, 
uh, technology was many times could even be smuggled into the countries. Brazil in the 80s, Brazil had a, a an informatics law that only allowed you to have computers that were designed and built in the country. For whatever reason, they thought it was a national security uh, issue, and they didn't want uh, Brazilians to buy computers from other sources than Brazilian companies. Um, of course, that led to a lot of smuggling of computers through the borders from Paraguay and from other places, because the computers uh, from elsewhere were cheaper uh, and most time, many times better than the ones that were made in the country. So people sort of smuggled the hardware, uh, pirated the software, didn't train anybody, and didn't know why uh, the implementation of, uh, of uh, IT projects were many times not successful. Right? It's, 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 it's obvious that, it would, that you don't get success when people don't feel that whatever is, is being done uh, is useful or is the easiest way of doing it. So what, uh, 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 what we will try to do this afternoon is to think about two different approaches to change in the organization. Right? I always think that it would be important, again, based on, on the technology acceptance model, one of our major models to explain how uh, what, what leads to a successful implementation of technology uh, it already says has to be useful and has to be easy to use. Uh, and then we'll see these two approaches. The first one is a 1993 uh, approach proposed by Benjamin and Levinson they, they, in a paper about the framework for managing IT enabled change. Right? Uh, and we will propose a second uh, uh, way of looking at, at change, uh, which is very hum humbly uh, proposed here uh, by a doctoral student of mine. Well, Ricardo Engelbert is, is now a full professor, but he was a doctoral student some 15 years ago, uh, in which we claim that there are some problems with this traditional way of looking at change. So first, let's have a look at the traditional way of looking at change. Basically, what uh, these guys here propose, Benjamin uh, uh, and Levinson, is that if you are the, the planner of the change, let's say if you're the ego who has to take the decision, you have to plan this very well. Uh, and the idea of planning it well is to make sure that the change that you want will happen the way you want. Okay. So uh, the good and the bad about this uh, proposal is that it's centrally planned. Right? One person or a few people involved in the strategic uh, um, core of the organization are planning and all the others are affected by the change. What we will propose in our, uh, later in our paper is that nowadays with, with the world changing so fast, with the environment changing so fast, companies should not rely only on their you know, on their, on their egos, uh, on their, their high uh, uh, the high manage, uh, the upper management to, to, to think and plan the, the change that we can involve many more people. Uh, I, I have mentioned here in a previous class that there's a lot of organizations that are doing open innovation these days. They don't want to do everything inside the organization. We don't want all the decisions taken by the decision leaders or uh, saying in other words, the decision leaders may wish to have some decisions that emerge from the knowledge their all their workers have, and, and that's something that we'll be deal we'll, we'll, we'll deal with in the second paper. But anyway, what these guys say here about uh, uh, the process of uh, managing IT first, they uh, show us uh, the differences of in the way things happened in the past, what they call here the traditional way, and uh, the way they happen after we introduce IT which they call the informatted way. It may sound a little weird, this informatted way, but basically here what they're saying is after you have computers as part of the, the system, we are in the second model. Have a look here. Uh, in the first model, we have an executive uh, that controls the process, uh, and, and, and this executive controls the process, which happens by means of the efforts of workers, managers that control those workers, managers that control other managers and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's, it's a process that involves a lot of control happening um, and, uh, and no technology or very little technology. And then they say, well, look, 
the technologies of today allow us to do it differently. Uh, we can have a model in which uh, the, the worker here basically works with the support of information that is available in database with some counseling from the executive and uh, the process happens w uh, by means of interactions with that base and that database. Anyway, two, two different ways of looking at the organization. What happens to the managers in the second way here? Where are they? What do you think that happens to the managers when we, when we change this way of doing things to this way of doing things that instead of having a managers controlling workers, now we have workers being, let's say, advised by an executive and, and well, they don't use the word control and, and that are controlled by the systems here, but there's also the control still there, it's, it's still there, right? But what happened to the managers? They're gone, right? At least they're gone from the diagram. Maybe, maybe the people that were here are still here, but when they think of you as the change proposer coming to a meeting with managers and saying, look, I have a solution for all the problems of this company. This is the past. The future is like this. And those managers are looking, where am I there? And they don't see any boxes with their names. Do you think that they will be supportive of this change? Probably not, right? Well, I can tell you that in this case here, the managers are not the ones that suffer the most because most of these managers here either become those executives here, you need more executives today than, we, than, than you needed in the past, uh, or they become the workers here. Uh, this is a knowledge worker who can deal with database, who can deal with a lot of information and, and information systems, so it's a sophisticated worker. In fact, this worker here is not the same as the worker that we have here. Which means that if anyone really had to be concerned about this change from here to here, it is the workers. This is probably why we hear so much complaint about automation processes or, or, or info, inf information uh, 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 processes that change organizations. Because what happens to these guys? They are they're out of business. Right? They, they will be fired. Uh, will, they, will they get work anywhere else? Probably not. The whole industry was doing this uh, move from the traditional way to the informatic way. So whoever lost a job here, being a, an unqualified worker, unqualified in the sense that this worker here didn't have to deal with any sophisticated technology. Right? Would, this guy would never get work in, the, in, the new, in this new uh, company. Okay? Uh, so this uh, process here, it has to start with this process of uh, generating, this, this problem of generating a social problem. <coughs> Um, executives in, in the organization, well, the, 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 the owners of organizations are mainly concerned with the, the profitability of their companies and the possibility of keeping alive. But the fact is that uh, these workers here are being outsourced to poverty or outsourced to unemployment because there is not a job that they will get after the world goes this way. Uh, so. First thing that we have to think, and this, although this has been written in the, the 90s, it's still a concern. A lot of our processes that bring more technology into the organization, they do create a lot of work. They do create a lot of new possibilities up here for data scientists, for sophisticated, uh, or, or even for some sophisticated workers. But they deny the possibility of some of the workers that were previously uh, in the job to, to keep there simply because they are not qualified for that. Uh, but anyway, what I wanted to show you with these two pictures here is simply that by, by showing them to people, they already will feel uncomfortable that the change will affect them and will affect them in ways that they may not necessarily be able to deal with. Okay. Um, and then they, well, they, 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 they do have some very yeah, interesting ways of uh, telling us how to how to uh, proceed with the change that we're proposing. But I would say the first thing you have to think is about this uh, social thing. Uh, unfortunately, many companies, many organizations are not concerned about it. But we have to think that nowadays all decisions that companies take are, even if it's not for because people are really conscious about their social responsibilities, 
customers are interested in the company's uh, social responsibilities, right? Society in general is. So sometimes companies that are simply cruel and decide, well, we're changing here and whoever loses their job, tough luck, we hope that they, they find other jobs, will not be accepted by society that do think, that does think that uh, organizations have, uh, have responsibility for those who, who it hires. Okay? Uh, but anyway, going back to that, those uh, problems uh, that the, te the technology acceptance model uh, had already shown, people are not going to be very enthusiastic about change if they don't uh, understand uh, it as being useful and, and, and being uh, easy to, to, to use. Uh, these guys proposed a few models here that seem interesting. The first one is this one in which they say, look, uh, there are three main reasons why people uh, reject a change they may they may not understand the change right if they don't understand the change they, they, they may be questioned why, why are we doing that uh, they may understand the change but still feel that uh, the change is uh, that, that, that they are that they are not able to cope with the change or that the change is not going to be good for them right uh, and they may also uh, uh, Think that the the situation the current situation is okay the way it is so they're, they're comfortable with the let's say the status quo the situation that they have and then the, this guy proposed this the simple model here to try and 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 take care of those three situations that lead to resistance they, they, basically this this paper they're, they're very concerned with the resistance of people to change they want to, to deal with that and and solve the resistance problem so they say you know one thing that you should do is well first if people don't understand the, the, the change, you have to do the, the following. You tell them uh, what your vision is. You tell them where you want to go with the change that you're proposing. You, you contrast them with the present state, the present situation. Show how better the future situation will be compared to this, to the current situation. Uh, and then if you think that they're they're not going to feel that they are able to perform the change, you do it in steps, or at least you propose the change in little steps. You say, okay, if you, if you believe that we, we may find it difficult to go from our present stage to that vision that we are proposing for the future. At least, do you believe that we, we can get from where we are to a, let's say, another future stage that you can call a milestone or, you know, somewhere in the middle of the way? And then from there, do you think if you are there, do you think that we can move a step forward still and, and, and get to another milestone? So provides uh, people with several future inter intermediary states that they feel comfortable with. Don't make the change seems something so radical that they do not believe that they are able to, to achieve. For example, uh, if the, this, this building here was on fire uh, and one of you had had the idea that, for example, you knew that, I don't know, that if we climbed to the, to the next ceiling on the top here, we could be reached by a helicopter or something, uh, you would probably find resistance on someone like me, who am not, I am not so athletic as I used to be when I was 20-something. And I will say, you know, I cannot reach the ceiling to, 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 to go to the top. And then, but then someone could say, well, maybe if, if we just have a few of the, of, the, of the stables here, one on top of the other, you can climb on one table, and then you climb on the other table. And then from there, we put a chair, and then from there, you can reach the, 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 the other level. I say, well, maybe that's something that is feasible, right? So again, the think of creating some intermediary steps, intermediary milestones that you can propose as possible uh, possible targets, and also when you, uh, that, that you can, when you reach those possible targets, you can, let's say, uh, celebrate and tell people, look, we came this far, now our next step is that, and so on and so forth. So basically, re reduce uh, the, the, the difficulty involved in, in achieving the results that you want. Uh, so uh, I, I find this model interesting as a way of uh, turning it feasible, something that people may find unfeasible if you if you present in a different way look it always requires that you plan ahead right if you're going to do this something like this you have to already have thought of where you want to what is the place that you want to reach what are the, the steps to get there you have to have planned all of that on your own and this this is the thing that i i don't agree as much with uh, this concept any longer because it's a solitary process it, it, it involves a decision maker that is deciding on his own and will try to keep others in, or to get others involved afterwards. Uh, 
I think that there are very uh, uh, several reasons why we think we, we should get people involved from the beginning these days. Uh, one of them is that notice we're not those workers any longer that appeared in that first model uh, from from the previous uh, page uh, that uh, were were completely uh, unable to do anything else than precisely what they did. We are all nowadays even if you go to a manufacturing plant and you you go talk to people in the production line you see that many of them have at least an undergraduate degree. So it's people that have studied much more than their parents have. And, and, and again, when I'm disagreeing with these guys to some extent, notice we are 30 years ahead. We are, uh, the world has changed. Uh, people are much better educated today than they were 30 years ago. So the decision doesn't have to be taken by a small group of people. We can involve more people and, and maybe be more effective in doing that. But there are still situations in which you will have to decide on your own, so it's, it's not totally lost to understand the, this process of deciding on your own, right? And, and planning on your own, deciding on your own, and pushing the change to others. Uh, these guys keep with their, their modeling here, uh, saying, well, before, before we keep uh, discussing their model, this, this is an interesting uh, drawing that they have, this, uh, and, and that reinforces a few of the things that we we have already discussed before. They say that whenever you're planning a change, you will change. You start change in one of these uh, five boxes that they show here. Sorry, five squares that they show here in this uh, drawing. You either change the strategy, or the structure, or the management processes, the individual roles and, and the culture of the organization, or the technology. Uh, and they say that whenever you make change to any of these boxes, all of the others are affected, so things will change. And then my question to you is, what is the box where we start any change? Look at the, those five boxes there. From which one of those boxes do you think that change should start? Structure, management processes, individual roles, technology, or strategy? Strategy. Why, Olafur? Well, the way they approach uh, things, they should change it. Okay, the strategy, I mean, it's, it, they're talking here about strategy as the action, not even the, 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 the planning. So, all these boxes, as, as we're talking about action already, it's, the, it's executing the strategy, not necessarily uh, uh, planning the strategy. But, but, but of course, things start through strategy because strategy is what connects the organization that is represented by all these boxes, right? With the external socio-economic environment and the external technology env environment. So changes in the socio-economic environment or the technology environment will require changes in the organization. And these changes in the organization will start with a change in strategy. The change in strategy is a change in order to uh, make sure that the future provides the organization with better possibilities than if the organization kept doing what it was doing before. Right? But, the, but what they say is, but watch out, you have a new strategy, you start putting your strategy, the strategy into action, this strategy will impact all the, other, uh, all the other boxes here, and by impacting all these other boxes, uh, it will lead to a different uh, equilibrium, a di different balance inside the organization. So, and, and this balance may not be necessarily one that was planned by the, by the change manager. Right? So we have to pay attention to this. We have to think the strategy. We have to think the challenges that the new strategy will impose with respect to changing structure, management processes, technology, individual roles. Uh, we have to think of all, all of that because th these other boxes will work as forces that will push uh, in, a, in different directions. Uh, and of course, our, our, uh, our change uh, needs to go in one intended direction that we have already planned. And now let's go back to the, to the way they, they plan their, their change. They have this, this uh, table here which I want you to pay good attention to. I many times call this, well, I've already told you about Nicola Machiavelli, uh, that, uh, that guy who in the 1400s used to write uh, about uh, how the princes of Europe 
should strategize so that they kept powerful, so that they kept alive, so that they, their kingdoms uh, uh, became stronger and so on and so forth. Uh, I said that Ma Ma uh, Nicola Machiavelli has generated the term Machiavellic thinking as being something fiercely mean, cruel, uh, but what he actually proposed was simply that you planned the change. And, and, and as a plan of the change, I like this table here, because this is a table that you, as again, think you're, you're deciding on the change on your own. You're the decision maker. You're the ego in the, in the company who has to plan everything. And you, you have to plan it right so that the change that you're proposing ha happens the way you want. So they claim that you should think of all the stakeholders, all, all of those who will be affected by the change that you're proposing. And then you include them all, each one of them, in one of these lines here on the table, right? Um, this each, each line should be here for either one person or one group of people that have similar perceptions of reality. So maybe I could have here, uh, you know, I could have here Alex Gremo, if I consider that he is being affected, or I could have uh, the the manufacturing engineers in the plural because we think that all manufacturing engineers when faced with the, the change that we're proposing will have the same perception then we'll have to write for each one of them for each, each line here each each one of these stakeholders we have to think of what is the change that is needed from these people right for our for for, for, for our change to, to, to be successful for our project to be successful what do we need from them uh, we, it's good that we also think what benefits these people, that, that line that we're working uh, right now, what are the benefits that they will have from the change? And at the same time, what problems they may, uh, they may see in the change, so what resistance could I expect? After I do this for all those involved, it makes it easier for me even to decide if the change that I'm proposing is feasible or not, because if I see that there's I feel that there will be a lot of resistance and little perceived benefits. I may even think, am I going to get into this? You know, do I want to start a change that will, will only have enemies and will have no allies from the beginning? Is, is it worth to do that, even if I consider that that's the right thing to do? Right. We have to be practical, okay? Uh, and then uh, they also suggest here that you you assess the capacity, uh, the readiness of these people to commit, uh, even the, the level of help that you could get from them, uh, from those that would not help at all, to those that uh, help happen, uh, to those that make it happen. And one important uh, last column is this column for recommended actions. Here, they believe that you should write, for each one of the stakeholders, write the recommended actions not for them, for you. What you have to do so that those people are going to help you with the change or at least so that those people are not going to disturb the change. I think this is planning for you. It's actions that you will have to do uh, to make sure that your change works. Can you notice that this is a very solitary process? You're, you're, building, you're, you're, you're planning this table on your own or uh, at the most with a few people that uh, are involved in the change process. It will affect a lot of people, uh, but, you're still, uh, but you're still working alone and you're, you're not asking those people. Although each time you, you include a, a new line in this table, the idea is you, what you're doing there is you're trying to put yourself on those people's shoes to, to try and see how they would perceive the change. Although you're doing that, you're doing that on your own. Right? You're not inviting them to come and say how they would feel. So it's, all, it's always your impressions, your ability to, to, to understand uh, what's happening. Uh, but I, I consider this uh, table here a very powerful tool when you have to think of these changes, large changes, it changes that affect a lot of people. Right? Before getting into doing the change, plan it well, check who will be affected, how each group will be affected, uh, we, which are the actions that you can take to make uh, those people allies or at least to, to, to stop them from being um, uh, opposition to the, to the project that you have. But it's, it's a solitary process. Okay? Uh, so this, this is the thing that we, we don't like about this. This is a solitary process. Remember, when we were talking about 
building a dialogue with customers, it was because we wanted to engage them, right? Uh, in fact, we, 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 we discussed building a dialogue with the customers, connecting with the suppliers, but one thing that you have to do is connect to your own organization, right? Have your own organization being together with you and not uh, being only affected by your decisions. So by working this way here, you're sort of keeping an arm's length from uh, your people, from people that would we expect that would even help you uh, with the change process if they understood the reasons, if they were, and if they agreed with you that those are the, the right things to do. So this is why uh, also many years ago, in 2000, and I think it's about 2010 or so, uh, Ricardo Engelbert, this student of mine, was starting to, 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 to deciding on the topic for his uh, doctoral thesis, and uh, and I told him, you know, I, I think that we are uh, experiencing different times here, where people want to get engaged in the decision processes, where people want to participate, they want to, they don't want to adopt or accept something that is already ready. They want to be part of it. I had already read Nambisan, Nambisan, for example, saying, get the customers involved in the conceptualizing of the product. So why do we still keep, we develop all of the, 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 the change, and then we want to push it against people? Why not get getting them involved in the conceptualization of change, in the design of change? When people are involved, they feel part of it. They feel that it's their duty to defend that change because they they were part of the the the, the, the team that uh, that planned it. Uh, and then uh, and then uh, Ricardo, uh, s we, we started thinking. Okay, so let's let's uh, check how we can involve. Uh, people in, in, in decision making and which people can be involved in decision making, uh, which people, it has to be empowered people because uh, people that are weaker in their relationship with their own organization, they feel, okay, I'll, I'll do what the boss orders because if I start asking or demanding or proposing alternatives, they would think that I am resisting to, to their ideas and I cannot, I don't want to resist to anybody's ideas because I depend on my salary, right? I, I want them to see that I'm collaborative with what they want, so whatever they say, I'll say yes, sir. Right? Uh, so we didn't want people like that to insurge against or to, to rebel against systems that were predefined and were, were, were there trying to set how things were going to be. Uh, and then we decided, well, let, let, let's see which, which group of, uh, we were more interested at that stage in studying not necessarily uh, employees, of the company, we were interested in, in studying users of a system, right, and checking which users would be more likely to rebel against the system simply because they, they can, simply because they are powerful enough to say, look, I'm not going to use that. Okay. Uh, you know, the first group that we thought of were medical doctors. Uh, Ricardo went to a hospital and started seeing, uh, uh, following the, the, impl the, the implementation of an information system that was going to organize all the, let's say, all the processes of that hospital. And he thought, you know, doctors are going to go against it because they have not been consulted. You know, the, the system is being imposed on them. And you know what happened? He went there and the, ado uh, the adoption by the doctors, the medical doctors, was smooth. Uh, and then he started uh, interviewing doctors to see why had they uh, agreed so easily to a system that they had not been part in developing. And they said, look, maybe if they had asked me, uh, I would have suggested something a little different. But come on, what they, what, they are, what they are automating there is just a bureaucracy. I want to get rid of the bureaucracy. So if they make the bureaucracy e easier, I'm happy about it. So if it's just a matter of making sure that the bureaucratic work of the hospital uh, works, I'm fine with it. So they followed exactly like uh, it had been uh, the, 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 the system had been designed. Then Ricard said, "I have to find other users. The, me the medical doctors are not rebels. They don't. They don't want. They didn't want to insurge against the system and decide uh, on their own. Let me see another powerful group of people that could be interested in in, in uh, rebelling against a system." And he went to the justice court, the court of, court of justice, 
to check a system that was being implemented that would allow judges uh, to write their, let's say, their decisions uh, in, a, in an automated way. And judges, exactly like the doctors, didn't get very involved. Again, the problem was the same. It was the bureaucratic automation of what they already did. Notice, those, both systems, the system that was uh, being implemented for the medical doctors and the system that was being implemented for the, for the, ju uh, for the judges for the, in, in courts, they both were support systems. They were systems where the technology was there to make them more efficient, to do exactly what they already did in a more efficient way. Do people complain about that? No, even if we take that, that TAM model, the technology acceptance model, we'll, we'll, we'll say, well, is it, is it useful? Do they think that it makes their lives uh, easier? faster to, let's say, to write their opinion, uh, is, it, is, is it easy to use? That's the only two things that a, a system needs when we're talking about simply, when we're simply talking about uh, improving efficiency. And then finally, Ricardo and I got to the conclusion that we should not be looking for systems that were proposing increasing efficiency. Because efficiency can be very well and easily man, uh, uh, measured. Right? Efficiency, there, there are variables that you can use to, to, to account for how efficient a, a, how more efficient a system turns those that are using it. So it wasn't questionable. And then we thought, what other systems can we think of that are not necessarily uh, planned for efficiency and that still have workers that are very powerful in their, let's say powerful, empowered users? And that was when we thought university professors, right? University professors, when a university is implementing a system, okay, there's probably a part of the system that is only for efficiency, the same way as uh, for, for the medical doctors and for the judges, right? For example, if they include a system for me to uh, check attendance of students, if that is more efficient, if that makes me check attendance in a faster way than I, than I did before, there's no way I'm going to complain about that, right? Because instead of doing it on paper, now I have a very easy way of doing it online. There's not, I don't, I'm not going to be interested in saying how that should be done. Maybe if I'm not an IT professor, right? I may say, well, do it the way you do it. If it, if it works, if it's easy to use, and if, it's, and, and if, if I find it uh, useful, uh, I'm surely going to, to adopt it, right? So the, when a system is proposed for efficiency, it's very easy to, to understand if it's going to be accepted or not. The technology acceptance model will easily tell. Is it, it, it simply, it's simply a matter of the user finding it easy to use or, and, or, and useful. Uh, but the thing is that when you're implementing a system in a university, you're not dealing only with efficiency issues. You're all also dealing with some effectiveness issues. Uh, the developer starts thinking that he can that, that he can help the professor teaching a better class. That's when you know the empowered user rebels because the empowered user in this case, if it was a judge, if if, if, if the guys who were developing a system for the, the the courts were also trying to teach the judge how to judge the processes, he would he or she would also rebel against it. They would say, hey, come on, this this is my matter. This is, I know about that. So I should decide how that will, will go and not you. And this is exactly where we started having uh, some interesting issues here to study. Professors are very rebel with respect to others coming and telling them how to do their job. Because they, they say, who are you to tell me how I should do my job? And they can do that because they are empowered in the sense that uh, they feel that they cannot be easily replaced. Otherwise, they would say, well, boss, if you think that that's better, I will do whatever you, you wish. But if they feel empowered, they will say, no, I'm not going to do what you wish or the way you wish. Simply because you're trying to force me to do something against what I believe that, to be the right thing to do, for example. Okay? Uh, so uh, we, we found, uh, we, we started studying uh, the implement, uh, how professors used an information system that had been uh, it had been adopted, someone had chosen to use that system, uh, 
uh, in the university. Uh, and uh, we wanted to know how, how that system was being accepted or if it was being accepted by professors, uh, if they were all using it, if they were not, if they were rebelling against it. And we noticed one interesting thing. We noticed that, where is that? We noticed that there were indeed some users, some of those professors, who would uh, adopt technology exactly as proposed. So, see here, you have the adopted artifacts, including all the different features adopted here, adopted by someone who took the decision of, uh, of uh, buying that system. Okay? And then we, when we, we looked at uh, the way that some of the professors used that system, we, we noticed that the technology in use, which means the way that they used technology, was exactly uh, as proposed. So they, they, they were using the, the features as is, as provided. Okay. Uh, but this was just a small group uh, among uh, the professors. Uh, many others were diverting from that somehow. For example, there were those that were refuting or denying to use specific features, right? That's the adopted artifact again. Uh, and then they said, okay, feature one, okay, I, I I'll use that. Let's say attendance uh, recording, perfect. I, I don't have to disagree with the way it's proposed. But then there's another feature here. For example, uh, the, the system requiring that the professor uh, I don't know, included, uh, included at least two links to websites on his program online. Is, is that too difficult to include uh, two links to external sources? Is the intention of, of the developer necessarily wrong? No, basically the, I would say that the, 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 the developer here, or the, let's say the, 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 the ones who adopted it thought, let's sort of try and standardize the way uh, our professors work, let's make sure that everyone has some pattern that is common to the whole university. They wanted to, it's, it, it, there was clearly an intention of standardizing things. But of course, the professors as empowered entities said, we don't want standardization here. Right? So there were, I mean, there were those that were doing as is, and there were people like me, for example, I was, I was uh, one of the, the professors that, that was being investigated at that, uh, at that stage. Uh, there were people like me that when they asked to include two links for the students, for example, I would uh, include for a, a, a class on strategic planning, I would include a link to Walt Disney's Three Little Pigs. Do you know that cartoon, The Three Little Pigs? No? No? See how culture changes from country to country. It's, it's such a, this is such a Western thing that let me, I'll, I'll show you, you'll, you'll probably know who these guys are. Let me see. These guys here. Do you know them? Or not? No? Hmm? Okay, well, I, I don't know. There's a, and I'll tell you why I included this as a link to a, a strategy class. I will, I was rebellious, but I was, not, I was not that rebellious. If my boss ever invited me to his room to explain why I was, I was playing with the, with, with the mandatory uh, demands of the system, I would say, can't you see that that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a lesson on strategy? What happens is three guys here, uh, the three little pigs, the, the story goes like that. Uh, there is a, one of them that they call the practical, uh, well, I don't know their names in English, but I, I, in, in Portuguese it's, it's the practical and the other, the other two are Hector and Cicero or whatever. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't matter their names, but the practical one, which we shouldn't even call practical, we should call theoretical, because he was the one that was doing all the planning. Uh, his, his, his two brothers wanted to be dancing all the time and, and having fun, and he said, look, it's summer or it's spring, uh, it's time, everyone is happy, but we have to build our houses because uh, when winter comes, it's going to start snowing in the mountains and then the wolf who lives in the mountains will not have enough food there and he will come down here chasing pigs. So we have to have strong houses uh, to protect us from the, the wolf. And then the other two were laughing about him 
but anyway, they take his, uh, uh, his advice to some extent. One of them builds a very weak house made of straw. And the other one makes a house made of wood. And, and uh, uh, the practical here is the one that makes a house made of brick, very strong house. Winter comes, the wolf comes down from the mountain, uh, blows the, uh, get, gets to the door of the first uh, pig, asks uh, the pig to open the, the house. He says that he's not going to open the house. Then the wolf just blows it with his, uh, well, he just blows it. Uh, and, the, and the pig runs to his second brother's house, uh, the wooden house. The brother receives him there, they're locked there, and the wolf gets there and says, well, if you don't open the door, I will blow this with my... Right? Uh, and he does that, and then they go to the third uh, pig's house, the third brother's house, the brick house. They get there, the wolf tries to put uh, the house down, and but it's a strong house, and it doesn't go down. So I think, I think it's a beautiful uh, example of, well, this was a guy that planned strategically, because he knew that in, in winter, Things would get worse, and they, and and they have to plan had to plan for that. Right? So I included a link like that. This this was rebellious because of course uh, I didn't even explain to my students why I had included that. I, I, to my students, I only told them, you know, there is this uh, system now that demands that we include two links. So if you want to have fun, I included a link to the three little pigs uh, story. Feel feel free to. I, I was rejecting the system, right? Uh, but I, but I had my reasons to, you know, because I, I, although I felt empowered, I didn't want to feel that empowered. Or if, in fact, I, I, I do think that I even told my students why I had included that and how that related to strategy, because of course I wanted to, to teach them strategy more than more than rebelling against the system. Uh, but uh, but that's clearly a situation in which uh, I was not using the, the the feature the way it was planned. And then I want you to start thinking one thing. If you are the developers and you see that users are not using a feature that you have programmed, what do you do? Change it maybe or... Pardon? Change it. This feature. You can change it in a way that you can even be more strongly, strongly uh, uh, emphatic about the fact that has to be used. You can prevent people from cheating. Or you can start thinking, look, if there are some professors that are not using this feature, let me talk to them and understand why they're not using it. And then maybe if they talk to us, building the dialogue. Remember, not even building the dialogue with the customer, it's actually building the dialogue with the workers themselves, people that work for the, the, the organization. They would they, they'll probably uh, understand our reasons not to want to be so standardized as that system was trying to, to, to make us. Right? And maybe they would change the system. So it would be knowledge man management. The third uh, vector in the Benka Truman Henderson's 1998 or 99 paper was about this learning from the customers, learning from the suppliers, learning from your own people. Right? I can tell you that generally that's not hap what happens because uh, most of the designer, system designers are still with that mind of the 1990s uh, and they still want to plan and do things on their own and force things on people instead of learning with them but you see that, that the situation gets uh, worse there are, of course there are, there are those people that deny the use of some features there are people that adapt a feature in fact I think what I was doing there was sort of adapting right I what, what I did in my rebellious way was not denying deny would be not using it at all but I sort of said, ah, these guys want this for this purpose. I will do it, but I will convert it into something else so that it supports my purposes and not their purpose. So in this case here, uh, we are using uh, uh, the system in a way that we are adapting the, 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 uh, the available feature. We also saw people that were replacing a feature. Right? There was a, a, a feature that was proposed there by the adopted artifact, adopted the one that was chosen by the, the decision maker, but then the user did not agree with that feature and brought a feature from a, a different uh, source. In the past, this was very prob problematic because many times when someone brought a feature from a, from a different source, this came as piracy. Right? Companies had to do a lot of work to prevent their own uh, workers to use pirate software because they could be penalized for that. So they, there are many, most organizations have ways of 
knowing what their users are uh, have installed in their computers or many times they prevent users from installing things in the computers because they don't know what people are doing and they, and they need to be to have some control of that but nowadays that we have a lot of uh, uh, systems that can be brought from from the internet and that are indeed free uh, when this happens what do you think that the, the developer here should do when, when the developer noticed that a feature that was included in the system is being replaced by another feature that comes from a third party he should add it. Hmm? He should add it to his own. He should. Uh, maybe, 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 even, yeah, maybe he could, uh, they, they could say, wow, how clever this user of mine. Let, let me learn with the intelligence of others. Let me learn with the knowledge of others. Gee, this guy found a, a, a feature there that is indeed better than the one that we, we had. So let's take ours off. Let's include this one and make sure that this works even better with our, uh, with our technology here. Uh, and, and, and then we can use the efforts that we would be using to improve feature 2 to do something else. What do they usually do? I can tell you. They will think, wow, dude, this guy is trying to sabotage us. Uh, he's against us. He doesn't want to use our system. It's using, it's, uh, he, it's using a different system because he doesn't like us. It, it, they put themselves in a fighting situation against their own people who are indeed not trying to, or not necessarily trying to put them down. Uh, we're just trying to do their work the best they can. And, and my main message here to you is listen to your customers, listen to your users, because your users may have a lot to teach you in, in, while they're using the systems. The, the dialogue is built by observing how they, they use the systems that you provide them with. And we still have this situation here where um, there was a missing feature here. Right? Of course, the developer didn't even realize that there was a missing feature, but whoever was using the technology felt the need to bring a complementary feature. Uh, and again, what is good for, for me as a user could be good to other users that may not know of, of, of that feature, that may not have thought of, and my again, my knowledge may help. Of course, these guys here, the, the developers, they can they, they, can, they can check what I'm doing and they say, gee, Alex has included something there. Let me try and understand it. Oh, great. This seems good. I will make this uh, visible and feasible for all other users, not only to, to him. So we become, the user becomes part of the development team if the development team looks at this use of technology that is rebellious, let's say, not as being rebellious, but as being uh, a, a source of knowledge, a source of uh, new ideas. And finally, uh, if, we, if we think of the whole uh, model now, we will see that there will be situations in which uh, users will refute, adapt, replace or complement uh, the, the existing systems. Uh, and uh, when, that, uh, when, when these things happen, there is opportunity for learning, uh, but there's also opportunity for fighting or for trying to make sure that you win and that you, are, you as a developer knows it all. Again, if you use the, the, the 1990s model, you're going to say, you're, you're going to plan beforehand. You already think, wow, look, I'm planning here this feature too, but I'm sure that some of the users will prevent using it. They, they will not like it, so they will try not to use it. I will make sure that I oblige them, them to use it. Uh, and over here, there will be people that will try to change uh, uh, our, exclude our, our, our feature and include another one. Again, I will make sure that in my planning that that's not possible. But if you, if, you, if you take that approach, you, you miss the opportunity of learning uh, and, and making our system e even better. So we, in this course, uh, we, we did not have the, the time to get into the detail of knowledge management, right? I would need at least another session for that uh, to, to discuss that third vector of, uh, of the Vega Truman and Henderson, um, uh, the, what, what they call the digital the, the virtual virtual organization the virtual organization uh, but you already have the, the, the idea it's 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 a matter of changing our mindsets and thinking that everyone else in the world knows something that we don't right? this is a Pierre Levy this is a French philosopher who, who, who has a book on collective intelligence uh, this, is a, this is an interesting book if you 
half time over. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, Levi. Le 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 Corrective intelligence. Where is it? Uh, Le, Le intelligence collective. Okay. Uh, there's an interesting uh, book in which he talks a lot about knowledge management there, but he's talk, uh, he talks on a more philosophical uh, way. Uh, but it, it gives us this idea that each one of us, each person alive, knows something that nobody else knows. And, uh, and mankind or humanity, we, we are going to become more powerful and even more intelligent, intelligent if we admit that and if we are uh, open uh, to, 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 to these ideas and to this knowledge of different people that can improve uh, our own, uh, our whole uh, performance, uh, our performance as a, as, as mankind, uh, somehow. Um, unfortunately, over the over recent years, uh, we have seen more of the collective stupidity than the co the collective intelligence happen in our social networks, for example. But uh, the tool, the technological tools that allow for for, for co collective stupidity or collective intelligence are the same. Maybe we just need to mature a little further as, as humans so that we can build uh, knowledge uh, in, a, in a way that we as, 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 a, as, as mankind are, are perceive ourselves as one only brain and each one of us as a neuron at, at the, let's say, at the edge uh, and all working together to get a, a better, better world for all of us. Okay? Uh, so these were the, the the papers that I had on on adoption, acceptance, and appropriation. And, but I would like to use uh, our last. Uh, we, we, we still have about uh, an hour, and I'd like to to have that hour for us to reflect. I said that we were not. We we're going to think about a lot of how to use technology to solve organizational problems. Uh, but I think before we can uh, deal with organization pro uh, organizational problems, we also have to think or, and, and plan our, uh, our own way of taking decisions in, with respect to technology in, in our lives, individually and as groups. And there is this uh, guy, uh, Neil Postman, who was a professor at Columbia University in, in the United States. He died in 2004, but uh, our technology uh, allows his words to be still with us. And I wanted you to think uh, about his idea of uh, how we should deal with technologies in terms of adopting technology. He's, he's much more critical uh, than we've been. I mean, in most cases here, we're talking about the possible positive uses of technology. I, uh, professor Postman used to be a, a professor of the history of technology. And studying the history of technology, he, he noticed that many times technology intrudes our lives in a way that uh, that it takes the decisions for, for ourselves. So he's all also talking about adoption. Yeah. Actually, I'm having a question uh, regarding this thing. Sure. If a technology is going to take a hard decision for you, it usually it is finding a pattern, previous pattern. Mm -hmm. But do you know the world is uh, dynamic, we can tell. So yeah. we cannot take a decision regarding to previous pattern. Well, uh, so if you, yeah, if if you, if you're thinking that artificial intelligence will not work, well, the fact is that artificial intelligence is already taking a lot of decisions for ourselves, and and you know, and, and just to go, uh, uh, I agree with you. It, it, it's very disturbing to think that that's happening, but at the same time, if you think, well, do humans know about the future? No, we also only have uh, information about the past. And our decisions are only artificial based. Artificial intelligence is only having the artificial intelligence. As a human, we are having a emotional intelligence. It's matter of does, does that improve or or, or or deteriorate the quality of our decision? I don't know. It will improve as a as a thing that if the decision is uh, dependent on some parameters, mm -hmm. which means tomorrow will be the rain or not, uh -huh. will be rain or not. This decision. Uh, I, I, I will like show temperature, pressure, this thing. So uh, an artificial intelligence can take a, a, a decision that uh, from this parameter we can tell that 
they are really rich. But as a, as you are going for a business uh, decision, till now I don't think that artificial intelligence can take a business uh, decision. Yeah. Uh, Shalash, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say that there, there are already business decisions that are being taken by, uh, by artificial intelligence. I also feel disturbed with that. I also think that, uh, but I, I think that the most disturbing thing about that is uh, about uh, we as humans, we are creating creatures, our, our, our artificial intelligence and our robots that do decide better than we do in many aspects. But, uh, the, the, uh, but as they do that, they, they turn us into obsolete. Uh, they, turn, they, they make us obsolete. But I so, think if the pattern will change, then they are ahead. Decision will be wrong. If the well, pattern will change. Uh, but, but think that our, you know, we, we, also, we, we also only have the, uh, the, 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 no, the past to decide. As a human, if you are going to take a decision, you will take your past experience also. And you will take a lot of things, uh, a lot of things to take a, a decision. Yeah, you know, all of those things are taken into account by... Yeah, but anyway, let, let me show you something that... that uh, be, be, before, before we get to, to, to Mr. Po, uh, Dr. Postman's yeah. video, because that's going to be very disturbing, and it goes along with you, because he's very, uh, uh, let's say, reticent, very cautious about where our technologies are leading us. And I have to admit that I am too. I, I do think that we're, we're advancing fast in fields that we, we're not very aware of where we're getting. Uh, but before we get to that, let me just so very uh, uh, quickly just uh, advertise the two papers that we are not going to discuss here, right? One of them is by Baskerville and Myers and Hugh. Uh, this was published in 2020, in the middle of the, the pandemic. And when I read it, it was, well, the name of, the, of it was Digital First, the Ontological Review and, and New Challenges for Information Systems Research, basically saying the world now happens in, the, in a digital fashion before it happens in the real world. It's an interesting concept, but basically it, it's, it's a paper about digital transformation. Uh, and I, of course, I read this in 2020. In fact, I, I read it before it was published. Right? Uh, I had access to, to this paper a little before, during the first semester, we were all with, you know, uh, uh, in the pandemic, we, we were all uh, at home uh, and I, wrote together with a, with a colleague and let's say which would be some sort of a response to, to, to Baskerville Myers and you in which I said things that, I, that I've been telling you here that uh, digital transformation has been around for quite a while but uh, the thing that disturbed me the most was that uh, when, uh, when, uh, when Baskerville and Myers uh, did their, their work they, they were only concerned in seeing where we were going but without reflecting on things like that, how, uh, how, let's say, um, automated uh, decision making is, is happening, how artificial intelligence is taking over and everything. And then uh, we, I mean, I, we finished the, the paper here. I hope you, you have interest to read it afterwards. We, we finished with Asimov because that was our concern. You know, Asimov uh, once said, concerned with the fact that we are, that our machines are becoming each time more Take, taking more decisions, uh, he of course uh, s uh, said that a robot may not injure a human being or uh, through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey, the, these are three, his three rules, right, for, for robots. A robot must obey the orders given by humans, human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And the third law, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. But then I finished saying, but that was only science fiction, right? Uh, in reality, I do not think that our robots are respecting this, these rules here. And uh, I, I do have the same sort of concern that you have. But anyway, this is just to advertise this paper. Uh, I, I put a lot of effort during the, the, the COVID, COVID times in writing it. It hasn't been uh, published because it had been invited by, originally by a, a Brazilian journal to be published. and. Uh, and uh, but, I, I, but as I said, I, I kept putting more effort into it, and they wanted the paper to be ready in two months. Like it took me six months to to get to to a final version. Then I was sort of ashamed of sending it that much later. I still think that it will be published one day, but uh, I, we have to decide where we're going to send it and and uh, and how. Uh, but uh, feel free to to read it, and may, maybe it will have some some not answers to your to to, to what is disturbing you. 
because it, I don't think that we do have answers for that, but it will have some reflection uh, towards that. Uh, I want to, 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 to share with you uh, Postman's speech. It's going to be very different to what we've been discussing, but he has six rules that he considers important, uh, that we, uh, six questions that he considers important that we formulate when we are to decide about the technology. I want you to take note of those uh, six uh, questions uh, for, for future reflection. We will not have much time for, for doing reflection, uh, a lot of reflection now, but I think it's worth, it's part of ado adoption of technology as well.